And I think that over time we're going to find that in the United States, um, some aspects of the ethnicity are going to diminish. So that the third and fourth generation of Ashkenazi Jews in the United States is likely not to know Yiddish and perhaps not to be so familiar with certain foods and certain customs. And it may well be that the third and fourth generation of Jews from Iran and Iraq are not going to be so familiar with the languages and maybe even certain cultural and ethnic norms. And then the question is going to become, so what's Jewish? I mean, what is it that we're going to embrace that's Jewish apart from the ethnicity? And trying to dig back and determine what about Judaism is timeless and compelling. And to try to present that in ways that encourage people who are experiencing unprecedented freedom to want to connect and learn Jewish and do Jewish. And it's a big piece of what guides my vision here at Temple Israel, providing multiple avenues and opportunities for people to discover the joy and beauty and relevance of Jewish life. And that includes learning, and that includes social action, and that includes um, music. And um, one, one final thing, you know, I think that increasingly I feel that we're not just educating children, and we're not educating adults separately, but we're educating generations who are the parents of these children, who are not as organically comfortable with Jewish tradition as their parents and their grandparents were. I don't think that we can take anything for granted, and I think it's an enormous challenge for us moving forward. Uh, it's sort of a follow-up to this. You, all three of you just mentioned openness, openness from different perspectives. I mean, uh, Rabbi Inger spoke about how in some ways, uh, for, 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 for many uh, non-Orthodox Jews, the, the, the world is much more open spiritually. Uh, and, and you're actually trying to respond to that by keeping, pe bringing people back to, in some sense, the Jewish fold. Um, Rabbi Horowitz spoke about how um, she wants to see more uh, openness in, in, uh, in, in her world. I think um, what, we're, uh, what we're all sort of talking about and thinking about a lot is where our young people are, right? Uh, with respect to the options available to them, uh, with respect to their understanding of Jewish institutions and their levels of engagement. Um, and I want to ask specifically if you, if you think that there, what are the things that, that, that you are all doing specifically to address those who are, let's say, I don't want to put a number on it, but, um, but, 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 but certainly mar non-married, uh, you know, no children, not, not in, in the general, uh, you know, the, in, the, in the group of people that, that, that tend to walk into synagogues. Um, younger people. It's my turn to go first. Please go. <laughs> you know, in traditional settings, I think it's a uh, it's 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 natural for for young people to find as their home at synagogues. Um, synagogues provide a service, and the service is to go to whether they go to um, minyan, go to tefillah in the morning, or go. Uh, to services on Shabbat, um, the building becomes a, a service opportunity. Um, but I think there's so much more, <laughs> so much more that's possible. Uh, I think a lot of people don't really know what rabbis do between like Sunday and Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, what do we do? <laughs> 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 we're having coffee, we're, you know, doing yoga. No, but uh, I think that the success of a synagogue is actually what happens between Monday and Sunday and Thursday, and not only on Shabbat. Uh, I think that, I think that uh, in, in our synagogue, we, uh, we have about an 800 family synagogue, and we are uh, whenever we're we're scheduling, whether it's around the, the holidays or um, Martin Luther King, or uh, we we always make sure that we have something for every uh, age group. Um, <coughs> so we have something for our special friends, for our our uh, people who are, live in group homes, for our seniors, for our our young, young marrieds. 
Um, and it's actually really a challenge to be a programmer, right? So a lot of, of what we do is provide relevant, interesting programming to attract people to synagogue life um, outside of Shabbat. Uh, and in a way, what we're turning our synagogue into is, a, is like a Jewish community center, where it's a place to, to come and you know, hang out in the lobby, um, bring your kids for a mommy and me program, or uh, you know, have a participate in a talent making contest. Uh, you know, what, what, whatever it is, we, we want shul, we want the synagogue to be the vibrant space where people are, are gathering. And at its core, you have to have services, right? I think it has to, it, it has to speak in, uh, certainly in, in traditional, in our traditional um, synagogue, it has to begin with, that's sort of the meat and potatoes is, is minion. But minion doesn't speak to everybody, right? That's not what brings everybody through the doors, um, even in orthodox uh, synagogues. And so finding ways, again, to make Judaism relevant through, uh, through uh, different venues, different avenues, is, uh, I think, is, is, is really what is, is necessary. Um, so I would say one of our big successes for the, <coughs> the uh, I don't know, what was the number you put on it? 30s, 20s? <laughs> um, was our, our fourth annual talent contest this year. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to announce that I'm the uh, um, four-time champion. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a silent. It is a silent contest. It's every year. It's nobody knows that it's my talent, and I'm embarrassed to say that I keep winning. So I think I'm no longer you're, you're allowed to enter. Everybody wants to. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to uh, you know be challenged, and I'm, I unfortunately I can't provide the recipe because my son. I'm, I'm very, very happy to provide recipes, but my son, uh, both my, my sons, um, have become very protective over the recipe, and so they asked me on this one not to provide the secret. So I'll, I'll respect them. Wow. What happens in Temple Israel stays in Temple. Yeah. And, uh, and Rabbi David will be serving it at one of the uh, restaurants. <laughs> So is it all right if I, if I jump in? Uh, jump in. Okay. Just awesome. jump. So, um, first of all, I, this is an important thing to know about you, so I will <laughs> certainly keep that in mind. I am um, rem just remembering, before I went to West Hempstead, um, many may know that before I was at Temple Israel, I was at West Hempstead as serving as the rabbi. And there was an opportunity for me to be the director of the Bronfman Institute at NYU. So I spoke with somebody about doing that. And I had never really considered Hillel work, but I considered it strongly. So I went to speak with Michael Brooks, the masterful director of the University of Michigan Hillel. And I said, just tell me something so that I don't look like a total ignoramus at the interview. And so he said, here's the way that I look at things. And, and it's, it's germane, I think, to, to the question that was asked. He said, very often, Hillel's think that they should be synagogues on campus. In other words, they should provide services on Friday night, and they should encourage kids to come to those services, etc. He said, that is entirely upside down. Synagogues, actually, should think about how to become communal Hillels. He said, synagogues should be learning from the Hillel model and not the reverse. And so I asked him to elaborate, and he said, at Hillel, we don't privilege one form of connection over another. We don't say the really good Jews are coming to services Friday night, and those who aren't really into it can collect food for the homeless, or uh, be in a barbershop quartet, or you know, play in a basketball league that raises tzedakah money, or whatever. And so he actually said that the cornerstone of his philosophy as a Hillel director is that you just determine where people are and what they're actually looking for. And don't pretend that you know what people are looking for because it's patronizing and often you're wrong. So I thought about that a lot. Um, and you know, what can we do so that people, 20s, 30s, whatever, it's not just that age range, um, so that people really feel that they are being welcomed and embraced 
whatever their thinking and feeling and connection might be, that we're not grading them, and also to give a safe space for people who aren't even sure what they're looking for, which I think is, is very crucial. I think that there are so many overt and covert ways that we pass judgment on people in synagogue communities. Um, you know, oh, the three time a year Jews, you know, we say in, in often in a very kind of patronizing way. But people who are coming three times a year are actually significantly more affiliated than many American Jews. And why are we asking ourselves what these people might be looking for and asking them? So I think um, we need to question some of these assumptions and think about making synagogues a little bit more Hillel-like in terms of not being judgmental and in terms of really sincerely trying to ascertain what people are looking for. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna agree, and I'm also gonna throw a little bit of a disagreement in. So I want to say that um, from the beginning, Roma, the city, you know, the community that, that I started was very much um, and we very much I was very uh, against kind of pediatric Judaism, the sense that we would create programming for children and bring their parents in, you know, as an extension of that. Like we'd have great family programming, and then parents would come and have to bring their kids because. At that point, people in most people's lives are think about setting out affiliation because they're looking, they're worried about their kids. So they had their twenties where they weren't affiliated, and now they're, you know, they have kids. They start worrying about it. And they join the synagogue, and I was very, um, I didn't have kids at the time when I started Romu, and I didn't want to start a shul like that because I felt that it works the other way around. I want to actually decide parents who want to come to synagogue so that then they'll bring their kids. Right? As a young kid, my dad didn't bring me to the great synagogue. For me, he came because that's what he did. You know, he grew up in an Orthodox home and then went to shul. So I went to shul with my dad. Um, so I wanted to start a shul like that. In order to do that, I had to think about, I had to actually remove myself from conversations about demographics and ask a much broader question, which is, what would make a synagogue compelling, period? Like, why would someone want to come to shul when there are so many other things that you could do? And so m my my answer, and the answer that I think that places like Ramamu and BJ and other places is, that synagogue worship can be the most boring form of death imaginable. Like you, you can, you know, going to synagogue can be can be murder. And and if you don't go to synagogue because you're worried about Jewish identity and the erosion of Jewish identity, and if you don't care about that, in other words, if you don't have a have to, what's the want to that synagogue life can compel you to? And why would you go to services? So. If you start from scratch, and if you're not orthodox, as I am, um, then you have the flexibility to say, how would I build a service that is both backwardly compatible and feels Jewish enough for someone to say, oh, this is authentically Jewish, and yet compelling enough for someone who could care less if you sing Rahim and Saron, Vayom and Moshe, or another melody, you know, what, what's going to make it compelling? And I think that was the question for us before we started dividing the pie into, well, programming for 20s and 30s, and programming for people who don't care about shul and God and so on. So my, 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 I guess my answer is that the first thing I'd say is 20s and 30s don't need anything different than a 30 and 40 and a 40 and 50 and a 16 and 70 in terms of walking to shul. They want to feel God's presence. They want to have an open heart. They want to feel that there's wisdom that can actually be applied to their life that they walk out and say, wow, this is really important to remember. I'm going to remember that message. They want to have music that uplifts them. They want to have teachings and other things that say, hey, I could be sitting and reading poetry and instead I'm here for this two hours or this hour and a half and it's really important. And then the second thing I would say about 20s and 30s in my experience, and we have, a, we have many 20s and 30s in our community, and they say this to us over and over again, which is, we want to come to a place that gives us leadership opportunities. We don't want to just come to our fathers and our mothers synagogue that says, this is the way you should do it, and you know, here's a committee that you should belong to. They want to actually set the agenda, and they are savvy, they are technical, they, they out in the world, they are, they are flash mobs that they start, and they're doing all kinds of great things in the world. They want to walk into the synagogue and say, hey, there's a place here for me to initiate, there's a place here for my voice, there's a place here for my generation, and it's not just I'm coming in and I'm doing what's been done for the last, you know, two or three decades or four decades. So those are the two things, and of course all the things that both Rabbi Stecker and Rabbi Harwood said are, I think, are vital for, for um, for being able to engage uh, the next generation. I think the last thing I'll say is, I think that the next generation is sick and tired of hearing about 
studies on the next generation. <laughs> the next generation is exhausted with being analyzed and picked apart and worried about and fretted about and what's going to happen and we're losing them and we're losing them and we're losing them. And they live in a world where the reality is that they could care less about the Holocaust. That's just a fact. They could care less about, uh, for the most part, about the sense that Jewish identity without Israel is meaningless. They, they really don't care. And, and we're not going to be able to knock them over the head and say, you better care or else. Because it just doesn't work. We're going to have to meet them uh, in the place of their own wisdom, what they're teaching us. And I think that um, that doesn't mean that they won't care. It doesn't mean that it's not important to them, but that's not the sole place for the, that doesn't drive their choices. Their choices are not from that place. And so, you know, take it or leave it. That's, I think that's uh, where things are. Yeah. It looks like you both have yeah. follow-up. Yeah. So, uh, what's your Rabbi Oh, so I, um, Rabbi Inger, maybe also just think about a core ethic in our synagogue is that we should actually all be together most of the time, and we shouldn't divide up based on uh, on different age groups. Um, we don't have we're we're not a, a multi uh, minion uh, place. We try to have one main service. Um, you know, every now and then you have your women's tefillah and there's the Sephardi, but generally we don't have like a young people's separate uh, service. And I think there's something really important and special about that. I think, I think when there's young people with old, older people, older people feel younger. And I think when there's, when there's older people and younger people, younger people feel inspired. And, you know, it's just at a, a Shabbat house where a older gentleman passed away and um, a, a father was there sitting Shiva and just describing how his young children were so moved by this, you know, almost 90 year old gentleman who always had a smile on his face and was uh, used to sit in the back of the shul with this big smile and uh, interact with all the kids and how it, it, it lifted him, but how it really lifted his children. And I think that, that that's, that's, that's what synagogue life should be. Not separate, distinct services, but, but we should all be together. Yeah, no, I just, um, I'm just reflecting on what, on what you said. Obviously, it's very striking, and I certainly also think about the connection that the younger generation has to Israel and to Jewish history. Um, you know, to uh, a certain extent to Jewish tradition. And so I'm just like asking you, do you, uh, how, how, how do you understand that? Because some people would say, you know, we talk about the millennials as being narcissistic. Um, I, I'm gonna go to a place that gives me a good feeling. And, and that's wonderful. I mean, who just wanna have a good feeling? But do you find that there's also a sort of outer directed concern um, of what might other people need, what my, my people need, and is that something that, that you're seeing? And by the way, to, at the prelude to that, which I should have given, I mean, people who have been at your tefillah and have been participated, you know, they, they, they talk about it as like miraculous. I mean, so the kolakabo to you, I, I just hear the most amazing things about what your community has managed to create, which is an exciting place for people to want to be. So that's amazing. But it, like, address the narcissism thing. Because <laughs> I really, 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 really need you to do it. <laughs> I, love, you know, I love your questions, and you're, you're such, a, such a thoughtful person. And uh, I think it's a really, it's, a, it's an excellent question about the narcissism of the next generation. When we started Romamu, one of the freedoms that I articulated was freedom to move the body during prayer, the freedom to have a full voice, all of these different freedoms. And one of them was a freedom to commit. And the kind of, the sense of tension in that, the freedom to commit, that there is, you know, the Talmud says, Ein ben chorin ela misha, right? Ela misha lo torah, that there's the, a true free person is someone who has freedom to commit, someone who has freedom to step in, like not being imprisoned by the sense of being on the outside and, and the feeling of weightiness that comes from stepping in, that might, that, you know, younger people might say, oh, I'm not gonna commit, I'm not gonna join a synagogue, whatever it might be. I think that the narcissism, you know, iPod and iPhone, and I, everything is I, I, I. 
you know, it's not Wii phone, Wii pod. I think that there's... <laughs> so, I think it's real, and I think that it's part of a, a modern problem. That's not just that generation, it's part of a, a modern malaise, a modern problem that hasn't gone away with the atomization of individuals and their playlists and their playlists and everything's individualized and every customer has an individual preference and so on. It becomes very much, and sometimes synagogues themselves with their market models, where you it's a pay for service and a pay, you know, membership is based on paying for something and then you have expectations as a customer. And there, there's some of that that's built into the market model of the synagogue itself, where it's not just you, your membership is showing up, right? It's what do I get for my membership, which is itself a very unique model in the American ethos. So it's kind of built in. That's part of part of the problem with synagogues, right? What do I get for my membership? We have to sell it like a gym membership. What do you mean? What do you get for your membership? You're a member, right? You should. Like we wouldn't in, in that model. We actually wouldn't give membership to people who are just showing up once a year, not because there's anything wrong with it, but what you know. A member is someone who's there in body and, and, and showing up on a regular basis. And if you want to be a donor, that's wonderful. Be a donor. So I think that you have to convince this generation that there's something about being a part of a community that isn't the same as being an Instagram or Facebook friend or a part of the virtual communities that they are so situated in. Right? It's different when you, when you show up in the synagogue. There's something happening that is true.